Hey guys, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive, where we entertain, educate, and inspire. And today we are going to talk about beveled stone points, beveled arrowheads. But they're not really arrowheads. These are actually atlatl heads, but hang with us because we're going to get into all that stuff coming up right now. So what we're talking about when it comes to beveled points, and that is if you look down the front of this point, you can see there's almost a twist to it and that's created when flakes are removed from one side and this is actually upside down you'd have to look at it from the back side it's a flakes are removed down on this side and then the points flipped over and they're removed on this side and there's a little bit of significance to that because this probably is not something that was done intentionally it was rather an unintentional coincidence that we have a beveled point now hang with me because there is a crossover between archaeology and experimental archaeology and also modern traditional bow hunting because there is this lovely resurgence of actually quite large points like this that are made of metal that are single beveled points and they're very very popular today with traditional recurve and longbow bow hunters very very heavy points with a single bevel edge and maybe you shoot those and I do believe that I have no proof of that but I assume by looking at the size and the shape they probably drew that inspiration from large archaeological points that are single bevel just like this but it has absolutely nothing to do with the bow and arrow because a point like this that is beveled is actually about 7,000 years older than bow and arrow technology, at least 7,000, that's, that's on, the, on the small scale, older than arrowhead technology in North America. Now, for folks that look at this and say that this was done intentionally, it's so it, it has some sort of helical and it flies through the air, number one, an atlatl does not work like that whatsoever. Uh, to get helical out of an atlatl, it's a very slow helical if you do. Uh, it's not like rifling in a barrel or any of that kind of stuff. And it has nothing to do with hitting bone and spinning and breaking bone because quite frankly, I can take a double beveled atlatl point and I can cram it through bro bone because it's so heavy uh, with the exception of say like megafauna bone or, or potentially bison bone with the exception of ribs. But stuff like deer shoulder blades and stuff like that, the reason that a single bevel uh, stone point from an atlatl would penetrate that is simply because it carries so much weight behind it. It has bone crushing power. Now, that's not to argue with the single bevel science that they're putting into the new arrowheads that are made or, or the new steel point broadheads that they're doing. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's not. I'm not up to date on that because I'm a stone point guy. But <clears throat> what I want to do today is I want to walk you through how this happens and why it happens and actually why it's most likely a coincidence. And it's important to mention that this isn't a theory that I just sat back one day and said, oh, let me come up like, let me see if I can come up with a logical explanation. This is something that I've learned through actually using the points and uh, seeing, uh, let's back that up. I mean, this comes from making using, which is very important, underline using, and sharpening, resharpening these points. And what's happened in that using, or making, using, and resharpening of those points, is I have turned out points that are inherently beveled in nature. So we're going to work on that here in a minute, and I've got a, a freshly made Dalton point, and the reason I'm going with the Dalton is because this is an original, this is a cast of an original artifact and it is a Dalton and it happens to be beveled. But we also have a lot of Bolins here in Florida that are beveled. And what's interestingly enough is the beveled Bolin points are actually a little older, about a thousand years or so older than the non-beveled Bolin points. And there's some interesting things to think about there as well. Now, if you really want to understand what the beveling is most likely about. It's going to be through the practical application of you make it, you use it, and you create it essentially on accident because that's what this is. It's not engineered to be special cool because it's beveled. It's an accident. But 
uh, and it completely goes away in the archaeological, almost completely goes away in the archaeological record as we get closer and closer to modern times. In fact, when it comes down to an actual arrowhead, we don't have beveled arrowheads. We have beveled atlatl heads, and even they fall out of, fa out of fashion, you know, uh, middle archaic time for the most part. So, reasons for beveling. There's two main factors I really want to pinpoint on this, and then we're going to go and we're going to show you how this one bevels, and we're going to walk you through that process. So two things to think about in early archaic times, and when I'm talking early archaic, we're talking nine, ten thousand years ago, uh, even into the transitional paleo times with some of the some of the earliest Daltons, is you have to remember that the stone that they are using is raw stone. And a lot of these topside quarries that the paleo peoples, who have lived for thousands of years in North America, have realistically picked up some of the cleanest, best stone possible that's in the quarry areas, and they've used it for making Clovis, Folsom, Cumberland, all these beautiful Midland, all these paleo points and knives. And as time goes on, these quarries are left with stone that's not quite as good. There's still some good stone there, but until you've worked on making a point like this, it's made out of raw coral with traditional antler and stone tools, you can't understand the difficulty to take a, a decent but not pure piece of high silica stone and turn it into a projectile point. It's very, very difficult. So it's a very highly valued resource. And then what happens is when you have a point like this, you tend to resharpen it over and over and over until there's nothing left and it's ready to be discarded. And so most of the Daltons that people find are, they're not even this nice, they're worn down to these tiny little nubs that are about, well, let's try to figure this out, probably about like this is what's left over. And so people think that that's what a Dalton is, but they would have started much like this and been sharpened down over a period of time, most likely beveled, and then so at some point the bevel completely erased and the beveling starts all over again. And there's a couple reasons that that happens, as, as again, the, the large amounts of moderate to good stone being used, but also the fact that there are many of them were likely connected directly to the long spear shaft component of the atlatl. And so when it comes to sharpening this, we're going to show you this here in a few minutes, how I sharpen this. Another thing to keep in mind as time goes on through the middle archaic and late archaic periods, people discovered heat treating stone where they could take a marginal piece of say uh, grainy chert or raw coral or anything along those lines go through a heat treating process in which I have plenty of information on as well. You can even search hunt primitive heat treating and that video will pop up where they literally bake rocks and it changes the properties of the rocks and makes it break easier and sharper. You can essentially turn a fairly grainy stone into a very very good stone but once they've discovered that and also the implementation of not only attaching straight to a sh spear shaft but also a foreshaft in which we can drill out either in hardwood or in cane and insert a foreshaft and this is easily removable and replaceable and also sharpenable in different ways in which you're going to see here in just a second so figure the advent of four shafts, removable and replaceable four shafts, and also the heat treating of stone. And so this is obviously fairly complex. I'm gonna to try to condense this down. Hopefully it starts making some sense to you. But I'm gonna to have to repeat myself several times for it to probably click in your brain, quite honestly, because it took quite a while for it to click in my brain. So anyway, let's move on to sharpening this. And again, this is a this is starting off with say uh, an early stage Dalton that has no sharpening whatsoever on it. So now let's sharpen this point over and over and over and over and we're going to see why it bevels and essentially why it's just a coincidental accident. Let's do that right now. Alright now if we truly want to understand the reason for the beveling it takes using this over and over and the more we throw it if we use it into an animal, miss, hit 
tree or rock or something, this edge is going to be depleted because a stone edge is not incredibly robust and so it does need to be resharpened. But how you resharpen it is by taking flakes of stone off and the cleaner the flake, the sharper the stone. So if it ends up grinding, you're not trying to grind this. You can hear how it's kind of chattering, it's going and then popping. That's not how you sharpen stone properly. What we have to do is take a rock and completely dull that edge. And then you hear one click. You hear that? Now if you've watched me sharpen stone points before, you understand that you should hear one click rather than a grinding sound. I'm not saying you'll never hear a grinding sound, but the idea isn't to grind the edge of the rock, it's to remove one flake which inherently makes it much, much sharper. Now I want to point this out because this is how we sharpen stone points. But when you have to think about when making these points and it's out of a raw piece of stone, it's uncooked, potentially not even a great piece of stone and you're using deer antler tools to sharpen it, it can be, it can take a lot of work to make this. And if you sharpen one side only when it's needed, just one side at a time, you could put a new edge on here, but you're going to remove less material, because remember, every time you sharpen and grind, you remove material off of this. And after enough times, it starts to look like this, where it gets thinner and thinner, and you can see these hafting areas. This is where it was hafted, the same as right here and it's left in the haft and it's sharpened until that this is gone. And what's interesting about this is you don't, this is all a resource, the pine pitch, the sinew, you don't want to have to take this off every time you sharpen a point. But also remember that this is attached to a very long spear shaft and when you sharpen it's much easier to stick the spear shaft behind your body and give it some stability up against your body and it takes the shock out of it. And why that's important, or moderately important, is if you flip this completely around and the spear point is facing you, there's a lot of pressure on the haft and you can break the pine pitch or pine mastic um, hafting job that keeps it solid. I mean, it's very solid in there right now, but as you sharpen, it can break that loose. You're less likely to break it loose if you support the shaft with your body and your leg and you sharpen this direction. Much less likely to break that half loose. Now, if you do break the half loose, you don't have to unwind all the sinew to re-haft it. Essentially, most of the time, you can just gently reheat because this is a, a heat activated, essentially paleo or primitive, I mean, it's very old technology, it goes back many, like tens of thousand years ago, you really back to Neanderthal times, this pine resin uh, mixed with charcoal, beeswax, and it's a very good glue, but it's heat activated, much like modern day hot glue, not as elastic. But if you reheat this, it'll reset itself. So if you do happen to break it loose, you can reheat it and reset it, but it's really annoying. So coming from a guy that goes out and hunts with this stuff all the time, you're trying, you, th you th make a throw, you miss, your point got dulled on a, on a rock or a branch or dirt or who knows what all and you want to resharpen it and you're sitting in the field and you carry along a flaker and you're like, let me sharpen that real fast and you break your, your pitch loose. Now it's really annoying because now it's loose so it's no longer a really efficient hunting weapon. Uh, but you have to build a fire to reset that. <clears throat> now that's not always necessary. So of course you're not going to stop in the middle of the field and say, "Cool, now I got to take and make a hand drill or a bow drill fire and collect my tinder and, and just just to reseat this." What you want to do is be able to effectively resharpen and continue to hunt. And if you need to reseat it, you're going to do that back at your camp. Okay, so that's the reason that we're sharpening it in this direction and it's always this direction when you're using a spear shaft, like I said, because you're supporting it with your body. So, we go along and re we resharpen this point just like this, all the way down, and then it's already sharpened on this side and we could make it sharper if we split, flip the whole spear shaft over like this, but then we stand a chance of breaking the mastic 
But what we'll do is we'll flip it over and we're going to do the other side. Working all the way from one end to another. We're supporting the spear shaft with our fingers and with our leg and that keeps this this union strong strong as possible anyway and if we're careful when we do it we can be out in the field hunting and not worry about it actually breaking loose almost done hang with me now by the time this is all said and done I can almost guarantee that I will have broken the mastic loose but that's because I'm going to sharpen this point over and over and over to show you how this happens. Now of course that's important to mention. I think if I haven't shown it to you yet in the video, I will now. But when I started off, I took video of the cross section of this in which there was no bevel in this point to start with. Okay, so now, actually our, our glue joint's just now getting a little bit loose. So in this, but it's actually still pretty secure, so I could go hunt with this still. And then when I come back to camp at night, I would reheat this and just reset it. Not a big deal. Now I've got have one little spot here that's troublesome. I want to get that. There we go. I mean, using antler tools to sharpen. So now, theoretically, we're going to do the same exact thing. We went and threw it. Maybe a couple weeks went by, a day went by, a month went by. You never know. You throw it a couple times. You did some practice with it. Maybe killed an animal, rehafted it. Who knows what all. The edge is depleted. So now we're going to regrind that again. And remember, this is not happening like in real time. Like I'm sitting here going, well, it was sharp, so now let me dull it and resharpen it. This is you use it, you bring it back. You use it, you bring it back. You use it, you bring it back. This could, I have uh, the one here that I've been doing with the Bolin project. I lost it. It's laying around here around me somewhere. I showed you it earlier. I've been using that now for over a year to record what happens in that year's time of hunting with that. And I'm noticing the same exact trends that I'm doing here, but what I'm doing is I'm accelerating the use and the sharpening process over and over and over. So no primitive man did not sit and just sharpen them and over and over. It was done over a period of days, weeks, months, potentially even years. There's times that I have favorite spears and there's times that I have not favorite spears and my not favorite spears aren't the ones I throw first they still work and if I need them I'll use them but they actually get used far less than my favorite spears that fly the best for me so there's no set standard of time in which we can say in this amount of time is how long it takes a point to be beveled that's impossible to, to come up with it depends totally on the frequency of how much the point is used how much the point is resharpened, and if it's your favorite spear or not your favorite spear. So now we're going through the same thing. We went out, we took it, we used it, we do it over and over and over, and we're going to sharpen it yet again. And now, instead of making you sit through this, I'm going to do this a couple more times, probably, probably three or four more times. And I'm not intentionally trying to make a beveled point. It's not intentional. I'm not trying to recreate this. I'm just telling you how you sharpen this over and over and over. That's a really important fact, and I need you to really understand that. I'm not saying, let me just sit down and make one of these and say, cool, I made a beveled point. That's just, that's totally out of context. Totally out of context. It's the use over a period of time in which you don't have to remove it from the haft because the mastic glue is still here you just reheat it and reset it. Now you have to, actually if you need more glue yes you can undo the haft but what you can actually do is heat glue onto this and drip it onto the haft area so over a period of time a lot of times your sitting you actually gets covered with um, 
mastic as well, but you can heat it and just like solder between copper pipes, it'll run itself up under here and fill that gap in all the time. So even if you have actually used up all of your pine pitch and broken little pieces out, as you drip more in, it'll run in and reseed. You actually don't even have to remove the sinew half. The sinew is a very, very valuable resource and there's a finite amount of good sinew in each animal. So, plus it's time. You gotta figure, if you gotta take this and you gotta cut it off every single time, now you gotta re-haft it, re-stick it, re-wrap it. It's just not, it's simply not efficient. So, again, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna do it one or two more times. Let's just go ahead and time lapse through this right now. Like, I'm gonna fast forward right now. Okay, so we're back and we've resharpened this whole point. If I could take one more little click right off the tip there, I have a weird spot. It's not important because for what we're trying to show, but it bothers me because I'm a perfectionist. Now, if we go back and we show a picture of what this one started as when we started, let me go ahead and show you a picture here real quick. And then compare to see how it starts to become a lot straighter, we lose some of the roundness, and it's also very much beveled. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this out of the haft, and then I can show you the cross section of this and how it's beveled, very similar to our artifact. Okay, this is the part that I love the most. Remember, here's the one we just worked on. Go ahead, you can see the bevel in it now, right? And here's the artifact. The difference is the bevel's on the opposite side. I'm going to get to that in a second. But we see some exact, very, very similar characteristics between these. And that is, you see the little ears right here from where it was hafted? Because we're not removing material here. When we first started with this one, it was actually out beyond this. And this is something you see in Dalton's all the time. Is that there seems to be this weird little ear, especially if they're beveled or resharpened over and over. And again, a lot of times the blades are really only about this short because they've literally been sharpened down until they are nubs and then they are thrown away. But this is very, very common to see these, these little hafting ears like we see here on the original artifact and it's because it was haft and it was resharpened over and over and over and over and actually once you get to like this point, this starts to actually stop penetration or slow down penetration into an animal. And so what may happen if they've used this one for a very long time, this one's actually still good. I don't think it was completely exhausted because what they could have done is unhafted it and then just nipped that little ear off and dished out the hafting areas and basically started the process over. In fact, I've even done um, some things where I've taken a beveled point and completely reworked it. I would grind this off and then I would use uh, either direct percussion or indirect percussion to take the bevel off like a platform and basically unbevel the point and make it smaller but we would start all over. So you have some Daltons that are actually quite small and quite thin. Chances are that this one was not at the end of its life. It was lost uh, probably, if I had to speculate, this one was probably taken out to either nip the ears off and resharpen, but what they probably did is they took it out and they probably laid it down and they probably made a new point um, or simply put a new one into the shaft that they were using and somewhere in the shuffle, the original that they took out got lost and got left there and then it was picked up, you know, many, many, many thousands, thousands of years later. Because this one is not to the end of its use life. It can still be saved. But they may have had a whole bunch of Daltons and pulled this one out and said this one needs reworked and just been like, I'll get to it sometime. And then they set it down and turns out it's never got reworked. But you can again see the characteristics between the ears and also the bevel. Now, when I was talking about the bevels going the opposite direction, I am a personal believer in the theory, and I'm sure I'm not the first one to come up with this, but it is a theory that I came up with, I'm sure that many other people did, and that is you have your consistent right-handed versus left-handed, where it's always facing this way, this would be what we would consider a right-handed bevel, that you're removing flakes off the bottom. This would be considered a left-handed if you were 
left-handed and holding it in this hand and removing flakes. Now, I'm pretty sure that there was a study previously done on this. I don't rem I, somebody was telling me about it, but I can't put my finger on it. If you know what that study is, please send me an email or drop a link in the comments. It's probably your easiest thing and say, hey, here's a link to that article um, in which they compare the number of left-handed and right-handed beveled points to the average percentage of people that are right-handed versus left-handed, because it's a very interesting project. Now, because I can't find that, and also I'm very thorough and I like to do things myself, I'm doing my own project in which I am going to use social media because it's this wonderful big world. People can actually send me an email picture, please just send one picture per artifact, like this, of the bevel. And I want to see what side is beveled on the point. So make sure it's not a reversed picture, because that's very, very important. You have to take a picture and make sure it's not reversed. Like sometimes, you know, on social media, if you take a selfie, it spins it around the other, day, other way. Don't do that. Take a picture in front of it, because I want to know if it's a right hand or left hand bevel and I will drop my email, my special email, just on the bevel project down in the comments. So if you're watching this and you have artifacts, not recreations, real artifacts of any point that is beveled, but it must be beveled. I don't want unbeveled points. I, I don't even care what style, if it's a if it's a Dalton, if it's a Bolin, if it's a big sandy, I don't care. That's not the important part. The important part is the bevel, like on this. If you've found an artifact, take one picture of it just like this, and for good measure, tell me what hand you're holding it in. Because this is my left hand. That way there's no confusion with reversed or mirrored pictures. I wanna know what hand you're holding it with, and I wanna know which direction, and by looking down the cross section, I can see which side the flakes have been removed on, and I'll be able to tell if it's a left-handed or right-handed bevel. Then I'm going to go also on social media and just take a random poll, which by the time you're watching this, that random poll is probably going to be done, but you can always email me pictures of your bevel points, always. I'll just keep adding it to the database. But I'm going to do a comparison on social media and look and see how many people are right-handed versus left-handed in the bigger control group that we get, the more accurate results we will get. So it doesn't matter if you're a flint napper or into, into anything. The important thing is to know if you're right or left-handed. That's the important thing. Okay, so the key notes in this, remember, is right-handed versus left-handed bevel. Also, the time period, early archaic to middle archaic, using, not always, but especially in the more common early archaic ones, using raw stone that uh, is tougher to break. Therefore, we can make the point last longer by only removing flakes off one side versus both sides. And then also the sharpening with the spear shaft behind you. And when we start seeing the bevels going away, it's because we are now implementing removable four shafts that I can sharpen this way and this way easily, very, very easily. It doesn't come off the haft nearly as easy when you're doing it on a four shaft versus a long spear shaft. So. Heat treated rock versus, versus raw rock, four shafts versus non four shafts, and directly attaching points to the main shaft. And also, interesting uh, data on left handed versus right handed. So make sure that you are subscribed and following along because as I get updated information, I can guarantee you I'm going to come back and say this is the data that we got off the left handed versus right handed project. So follow along and also if you are interested in kind of reviewing some of this yourself this cast this is a cast of an original and I do the casting here at huntprimitive.com you can go on my website under the archaeology or experimental archaeology tab and look for casting and if you look around we've got lots of casts but this will be available if you want to purchase 
a cast of an original artifact. You'll be able to purchase ones that are painted just like this, and you'll also be able to purchase ones that are just plain white. Make sure you check out the casting and also the Cast of the Month Club. So I have lots of different uh, things that you should go look at, but make sure you subscribe, follow along, because at some point, like everything else, we're going to take all this stuff out hunting and kill stuff with it, put it to real use. But thanks for following along, and we'll catch you on the next adventure.